Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Invisible Wound. This podcast is a limited series of six episodes, which is part of a larger project called Hakara, Facing Transgenerational Trauma. This project was initiated by Amcha. Amcha is an organization that was established in 1987 by a group of Holocaust survivors and devoted mental health professionals. My name is Sharon Rywakan. I'm a Berlin-based filmmaker and a third generation of survivors of the Shoah. This is the perspective I'll be speaking from. For this podcast, we will be traveling to what is known to be the world's oldest continent, and which we know as Australia. The Aboriginal people of Australia are the custodians of the world's oldest living culture, a culture that is 60,000 years old. In order for me to avoid any types of cultural appropriation, I ask each of my guests to introduce themselves and for them to share where they are from and how they perceive trauma, and also how fighting trauma is present in their work and in their lives. And now let me welcome Tanya. Hi, Tanya. It's so nice to have you on this podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Sharon. Um, my name is Tanya, and, and firstly, I would like to acknowledge that the traditional lands that we're meeting on today are the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to their spiritual relationship with this country. And I acknowledge their cultural beliefs and heritage that they are custodians of this land. Um, thank you for having me on here, and I'm excited to chat with you about this beautiful topic, which I think is so important that we're speaking about today. So, would you like to introduce yourself? So, uh, I was born in a town called Port Lincoln, um, so south of Australia, in South Australia, um, and lived between Adelaide, uh, the city where I am now, uh, where I live now, um, and Port Lincoln. Uh, my teenage years were spent in Port Lincoln, um, which was interesting. <laughs> um, I just turned 40, and I, I just had a quiet uh, little celebration with my family, just a meal nothing special <laughs> um, in COVID times, I guess, also, but I've always been an introvert. So I, I work in um, admin, administration uh, for government, and I have for years um, different organisations. Um, it's my day job, helps pay the bills, but I love to write. So tell me a bit about it. I have one educational reader published um, and another um, kids novel to be published uh, next year in maybe May next year. I do like writing for children because it takes you away from some of the more sombre um, and sometimes harsh aspects of life because you can lighten it up a bit for them and make it exciting and sometimes just add a bit of imaginative play and that sort of thing. And I feel like the, the optimism which children have is something that um, is beautiful and we sometimes lose that as we get older and have to fight our way through <laughs> um, in the workforce and would it be right to say that you like to enable dreaming oh that's a beautiful way to put it yeah definitely it, it feels very concrete to live in a very structured society you get up you have your wheat bix or whatever um cereal you like and you go to work then you maybe have a little half hour break go home, put the TV on, watch the news, go to bed. And maybe you play a sport on the weekend and then you do it all again. That sort of thing where it's um, just this structured lifestyle that you feel that you have to 
fit into what you kind of do <laughs> if you want to pay the bills. Um, but does it give you that space to, to dream and breathe? And I don't, I don't know if it's Western culture, capitalism, or just how we're made to um, comply by rules, rules, rules. And The podcast name is Invisible Wound, as you know. Um, so mm -hmm. what comes up for you? Which images, memories, words, you know, stories, songs, you know, come up for you when you when you think of that being who you are? Yeah, that does um, invite me to think about times where I've experienced awful pain from racism and bullying and especially at school. Um, so I, I have had to go to a school where I was like one of maybe a handful of Aboriginal people and the rest of the school were all white or, um, <clears throat> sorry, not, not looking much like me. Um, or caring much, I don't think, about Aboriginal people. So in Port Lincoln, my high school years were a little bit strained. When I was in high school, there were a few times where I had to, I guess, um, try to go incognito and not be myself because I felt quite out of place with brown skin and everyone knew that I was Aboriginal and I didn't um, feel welcome. Unfortunately, I did by teachers and a couple of students, but not the whole. Um, I didn't feel quite welcome um, by the school as a whole, um, mainly, I think, because they just didn't have uh, very much interaction or experience talking to people like myself or, you know, um, friendship groups and for their families weren't really connected to the Aboriginal community, which seemed quite distant from their world. So I felt like I didn't fit in. And this, I think, led me to be painfully shy. Um, so when you say invisible wound, I just think of times where I've had to go up and talk about myself or I've had to do um, a school project and one of the ones I chose was one, uh, a sprinter called Kathy Freeman who won gold at the Olympics and I talked um, to the class year nine, I was about 14, about how proud I was when she won and there were sniggers from boys in the classroom and I just felt so belittled and... What would they say? In pain. They were just making, you know, that sort of snigger. It's kind of like a laughing sound where they're just like, <laughs> you know, like, oh, goodness, that's just horrible that you think that's great. This Aboriginal person has won a race and, wow. Um, they would... Uh, I guess impose the power over everybody in making them feel ashamed. But shame is something that Aboriginal people have felt um, since colonisation. So that was just uh, one of the ways where it was perpetuated <laughs> and uh, carried along so that I still sometimes feel like a little bit of this shame and that pain of feeling not good enough and not being able to feel proud of something which an Aboriginal person has done, even though I know that it's amazing and I just have to fight myself and say, hey, that is amazing and just well done you. <laughs> So I guess that's something that's good that's come out of it is that I can 
praise others and lift them up. Um, especially, we really need to do that in the Aboriginal community and make each other feel proud of who we are. Um, because of how many people have who have told us that we're not good enough and how we don't really belong here, even though Aboriginal people were here for thousands, tens of thousands of years. It does seem bizarre. So what you're saying is that you're made to feel invisible by those others. I guess I wanted to be invisible. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> I wanted to just retreat inside myself and not be seen or heard. Um, especially when being myself seemed offensive to others. And having, you know, a different colour of skin or a different um, racial background um, to others just seemed like it was something bad when I knew it wasn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. It does really mess with your head. <laughs> but, yeah, I did feel um, disconnected then from Australia, even the landscape. Sure. And when I went overseas, <clears throat> sorry, when I was uh, 17, I uh, travelled overseas for an intercultural exchange program. I was looking forward to being so far away from Australia because I felt so disconnected from it. And the gum trees and the landscape, which I felt had somehow turned bad. Is writing then a way to reclaim your culture, your land? I guess it's a way to... Yeah, I guess that's true in a way because it's saying this is something that I feel a connection with. I'm not sure I will say my land. I guess it's more the land has me and owns me and I'm connected to it. Um, and it's, you know, a beautiful place and it's spiritual and it's um, somewhere where my ancestors are living and, mm -hmm. you know, they're here. So I've made a mistake. Uh, I realized that um, I've read this beautiful sentence actually saying that one of the things, um, one of the main differences between, um, let's say, Aboriginal culture and Western culture is that um, in Aboriginal culture, you're not a landlord. Uh, you are guardian of the land. Is that right? Is that the mistake that I just made? In a way? By saying oh, um, owning I get, land? Oh, yeah, I, I guess... Um, the an Aboriginal viewpoint is that you can't own land, really. You can protect it and love it and be one with it, but it, you can't kind of say, this is my patch of dirt and I'm going to fight anyone <laughs> who wants to also walk on this patch of dirt. Or <laughs> It's about sharing and letting the land nurture us and keep us safe and happy and not um, about how much money can I get for this plot of earth. <laughs> I think a lot of people have disconnected themselves from that sense of oneness with everything around especially with the earth mm -hmm. so um, I, I definitely believe that going back to that um, connected state is extremely important if we can manage that so that we can't um, keep on wrecking something that's good for us. This is one of your topics, isn't it? 
although you write it for children. Is that correct? Yeah, I do like writing about nature. Mm -hmm. And the title of my first kid's book is Super Nature Stars, which I'll read a little bit from. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is about connecting with nature. And then my next book will also be about that. So, yeah, it's a running theme. And, and, and is I the, guess it's, it's, an, it's a message I want to impart is, yes, we should be connecting, reconnecting, or just connecting for the first time and finding out how brilliant it is and how it enriches our lives. What is it that we can learn from nature, according to you? A feeling that it's meant to be like this. It's meant to be naturally untouched and, and not messed with too much because once you disconnect yourself so much from that space, you're not whole. You're not feeling part of that. I guess it's, um, I'm trying to find the word, nourishment and beauty that you can uh, gather from having feet um, connected to earth that And, and a space that's not been, uh, what's the word, um, wrecked. Tanya, is this then specific to Aboriginal culture, would you say? Definitely. And I think all to, it's, it's something that probably resonates with all people when sure. they're out in, in, um, in nature. Mm -hmm. I do feel, uh, well, not, a lot of people maybe not feeling much, but um, I think there are an, a lot of nature lovers as well <laughs> who do feel quite um, connected and at peace, especially um, near a body of water like the sea or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a nice peaceful river or uh, beside a mountain. If I understand you correctly, um, the disconnection from nature is actually one of the results of colonization. Definitely. definitely um, I can tell you a bit about the history um, where, it's quite sad, where um, Aboriginal people were ripped apart from the land where they were living and thriving and placed into missions and um, thrown off of land by farmers and people in charge and they were made to live in sort of like little townships or areas and just bundled into little homes where they couldn't roam freely and feel that connection anymore and were told not to speak their languages and told instead um, to act like the colonizers. Mm -hmm. And that ripping them apart from something which made them feel so connected and whole has done quite a lot of damage, as you've said, um, with trauma um, that Yeah, I can, yeah, it has been uh, with us since this happened. So it, it's hard to overcome. It's hard to think our, our ways out of it. <laughs> of course. When you think of how much has been lost. Mm -hmm. And that impacts um, you but to this day. Definitely, and I want to hold on to what I can. And a lot of us do. We want to reclaim or hold on as hard as we can to what we can. Um, understand about the culture that 
um, had been, I would say misplaced. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say it was completely lost and that that's something that we, well, I tried to avoid it saying because you know you might as well just give up all hope if you say right that culture was lost it's not true we are holding on as hard as we can and we are, we will continue to do that and we will um keep passing on what we know and i hope that the values that have remained will stay in our hearts and i really feel that they will Connecting you back to to your work and to your work as a writer. Um, yeah, tell me, tell me more about it. Sure, I I think that writing is something that I can do while no one's watching. <laughs> so then I don't feel any shame about it. I could just type a few words and and come up with stories and and make them be whatever I want them to be. So, what is your next book about? It's about um, a young person from the UK, from London or out of L London, who has lost her father at a young age, at age six, and he's um, he was Indian. Um, and her mum's English um, and taking her to Australia to live because she's fallen in love with and the mother's fallen in love with an Australian man and the main character, Alex, um, is needing to, I guess, understand how to fit within an Australian society and in an, a family where there are Aboriginal um, siblings. You already said that you would uh, read a little bit from your former book, Supernature Stars. Could you tell us a little bit what your book is about and who the characters are? Oh, sure. No problem. So, Denny is, I have to go back, he's around 11 years old and he is spending some time at his auntie's house helping her with some cleaning Mm -hmm. Um, but everything he does makes more mess <laughs> and he discovers that at her place, everything just seems to want to be messy and how, how it is. And she's okay with it being, um, with, with, uh, animals and like possums who live in the roof and with a spider inhabiting the bathtub <laughs> she's fine with um other living beings around her and she doesn't really um mind too much that he's making such a a mess because there is a a reason he's there it's that they have a surprise birthday party for him <laughs> which is out in the bush so this is chapter four. It's called Fly Away. Mm -hmm. Beep, beep, beep. Annie Yanni calls me over to a window and we spot mum's car through the weeds. I think your mum wants to, us to go out to her. It must be home time already, says auntie. I dash outdoors and the magpie decides to follow. So I dash back in, close the windows and head out again. Auntie comes too. She locks the front door and sighs. Look out for snakes, I say to her over my shoulder, making a run for mum's car. I flop onto the back seat and auntie clamours in the front. Jara is sitting beside me and starts tapping my knee, but I don't care. I'm cooling down in air-conditioned comfort. Auntie looks happy now too. Mum is frowning. Sorry for beeping, she says. I was trying to get Jara to hop out, but he wouldn't. I'm too scared of the sun magic thingy, whines Jarrah. Mum and Arnie look confused. I just ignore him. I'm glad you came to the rescue, Mum. Nothing at Arnie's house works, and it's being overt overtaken by wildlife, I say. Oh, I don't mind the beautiful family of possums in the roof at all, Bub, Auntie Annie says. 
But yes, we've had a few things go wrong. Nothing that can't be fixed later. Can I tag along with you now instead? I'm sure I see Auntie Yanyi wink at Mum. Where's Uncle Tom, I ask? We didn't end up staying at the beach, so Tom took off to do other things. There wasn't much shade or any room under the jetty. The sand was like lava, Jara butts in. My big toe touched it. The top bit got burnt, but my toe is still alive, lucky. Are we going to the really nice holiday place now, please, please, please? Well, it is the school holidays, says Mum. Yay, deadly, Jara cries. So where exactly are we going? Now, if we're not going home, I ask. Just you wait and see, says Mum. Jara giggles. Mum and Auntie are up to something. That's okay, I don't mind sneaky surprises. So that's chapter four. <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Say Arita wanted to read your book, what could they do? They can probably see if they can borrow it at the library if they're in Australia. I'm not sure if internationally this can work. But there will be your new books otherwise. And will that be distributed internationally? I'm hoping so. I did hear from a previous editor I had that, yeah, it has the potential to be published in different countries. So I'm really hoping this happens. Okay. So... You know, the term collective transgenerational trauma, right? When you hear that, um, how do you connect to it? I feel like it's um, probably a terrible feeling that we all are realizing that we have, even though it feels sort of isolated and within oneself like you feel like you're carrying the whole burden yourself but you realize that so many other people are also carrying this and your ancestors have also had even heavier loads to carry that means that you know we have we have to try to lessen the load in in uh, ways of dealing with it, um, understanding, accepting, and feeling it deeply. I think it's good to look at it and talk about it and acknowledge it, and you can't just sweep it under a carpet because that doesn't lead to healing. Talking about it does and writing about it or um, capturing the feeling in some sort of art form is, is a way to say, here, here, it's here. Um, we can see it, we can feel it and no, we're not imagining it and it's something we need to acknowledge because it's part of us and we will together heal from it but we'll never forget it you know what's so interesting when i hear you speak is that um you know being a, a third generation of uh, survivors of the holocaust the shoah as we call it mm, I, it was a long journey for me to even recognize it, you know, how trauma had impacted me. In the process, I, I learned that the past is never done when there's trauma. Actually, that's one of the signs of trauma, that the past feels present. A very helpful sentence for me to start acknowledging and, and recognizing where I'm at, really. Um, do you feel that this is something that, that speaks to you or resonates with you? Oh, yeah, definitely. It can't, the past can't leave us alone. Um, <laughs> but then perhaps it shouldn't. You know, it needs to be with us. And it's just awful. I'm so sorry, like, this happened with your family 
and you try to think about it and it just see and I can understand how hard it would be to look at that and then try to make sense of it because there isn't any sense to be made <coughs> sorry to be made from such a sad thing that should never have happened and and you have to then be brave and say okay I'm going to open my eyes and see and you know you can hold your hands in fists and go I'm strong I can do this <laughs> and uh, you're amazing to um, to be looking at this topic and having some fantastic discussions with people about it because this is a really good way to, I guess, um, look at something that is so terrible, but at the same time, we have to look at it together and it's nice to be able to talk to you about um, these invisible wounds because even though we're so far away you know, from each other right now, we both feel this trauma and we feel that together. That's beautiful. Thank you, Tanya, for saying that. Yeah, you know, the title of Invisible Wound for me means actually it's an act of resilience by saying, by calling it that way. It's actually hoping to do the opposite and making it visible, really. But acknowledging at the same time that uh, society wants us to be invisible. And I say we because I think that this is something where collectives want to pretend that um, the act of violence has not happened, right? Definitely. And um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can actually learn from one another, you know, that maintain the specifics of, um, of each history and each culture. Mm, because I think it's very important to be precise as much as one can. Being Jewish, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't know anything or I'm learning about Aboriginal cultures, but, you know, of course, I'm, I'm a foreigner to it, right? I'm an outsider to it, but I can try to identify and um, empathize with uh, the pain due to the own collective trauma. Mm -hmm. mm. And this is, um, you know, it's a very idealistic True. way of hoping to, to connect, actually, and to learn from one another. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> so if I ask you the question, do you feel like a traumatized person? Is that something that, you know, how do you feel about that term? I mean, how does that make you feel? I guess it's um, it's an appropriate term given that so much of what happened to Aboriginal people was just shocking and horrific and so awful that, yeah, I'm sure that people don't want this to be spoken about. They want it to be invisible and they want to i guess pretend that it didn't happen but aboriginal people were treated in a way that was so terrible that it's taking so many years to just try to come to terms with what happened and be able to speak up and be heard and I believe Aboriginal people have been trying and trying to to get their voices heard and today maybe we can be heard a little bit but the audio is not clear <laughs> there, there isn't enough volume for our voices <laughs> so we need to be shouting louder or I'm not sure how to get the message out um, but some terrible things in Australia are still happening, so. What are you thinking about when you're saying that? 
Sure. What comes to mind firstly is Aboriginal deaths in custody. And we've had over 400 people die in custody, um, so police custody. But it's obviously a problem in that there is racism in not being able to see Aboriginal people as human beings still <laughs> and treating them like, um, like criminals. And this is quite sad um, that we've had this many deaths in custody um, even though we've had um, people look into it and experts and recommendations and politicians saying they'll do more but it's still happening Pe people are dying in prisons Aboriginal people and and they're overrepresented mm -hmm. in our prison populations and this shouldn't be happening um, so since 1991 mm -hmm. So more than 400 Indigenous people have died in custody. And when there were the Black Lives Matter rallies um, and marches, protests, we came out in numbers to try to bring that to people's attention, but it just doesn't seem to be a top priority unfortunately, because after each protest, they would, we'd hear another story of somebody else has died in custody and we think, what is going on in this country? How does it make you feel? Oh, it just makes me feel like bawling my eyes out. Um, for example, there's one Aboriginal man who died after... Um, people told him to stop eating biscuits, but he needed to eat them for his diabetes. I think he had her illness. So, you know, how can you tell people not to eat when they're sick? Um, so there are so many stories where the inhumane practices have, have led to people dying. And why are Aboriginal people getting locked up and put into those awful circumstances in the first place? So we're needing really to look at this issue urgently. Do you feel like every time you hear about an act of police brutality or something racist happens, that this is a re-trigger of a collective trauma that, of course, started with colonization? Definitely. So when you hear the pain and suffering inflicted on someone who's been, well, sometimes it's, it feels like they've been murdered in custody, not listened to, um, just left to die in a cell, you think, why is this still happening? They don't care. They just don't care. Um, and it feels like it's a continuation of the brutality that began with colonization and with People coming and saying, you know, we know more than you. We know how to treat you and what you should be doing. And and if you don't abide by these rules, well, if you want to live a different life, we can lock you up. We can do what we like. And sometimes you could be killed. <laughs> um, so I, I don't feel like um, non-Aboriginal people know this as much what this feels like. Do you ask yourself the question sometimes, Tanya, why people are acting that way? I just can't understand. I really can't. It makes me sick and I can't understand why anyone would want to lock up a 10-year-old or 
why anyone would let someone die in a cell and not care if they were in pain, why there needs to be brutality when people are just trying to live and survive in a peaceful manner. And sometimes, you know, they, they may not pay their bills or something and they have a, a fine for their arrest because they haven't paid a bill or they owe money or sometimes um, they, they may have um, been drinking and been rowdy on the street and so they've been pushed into a cell instead or um, sort of pushed around so much that they've uh, been killed. I mean, this has happened as well. So I think that the, this type of brutality can come from maybe psychopaths or sociopaths or something, but the system itself enables these types of people to um, enforce rules and enforce the brutality upon those who are not in the same position of strength and much, you know, in a weaker position. And, like, who would want to hurt someone who's defenceless or drunk or they're a kid? Or I just don't understand that. When you think about collective and transgenerational trauma concerning your own families, meaning your parents, grandparents, etc. What are sort of the stories you grew up on? Oh, sure, yeah, I can um, remember my mum talking about, I think it was her grandmother who wasn't allowed into a shop. She had to wait outside. So being really... Um, Having, having dark skin meant that she wasn't even allowed inside a shop. She had to wait outside and be given the food or items. That's so hurtful to me. Um, stories of um, people being told, no, 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 you speak English, you don't speak your language. And so mum couldn't learn from people who spoke Aboriginal languages um, and then pass it down to me. She knows a few words, but or maybe she knows, I don't know, 50 to 100, but nothing like the amount that we'd hope to, to know. Um, so having um, that sort of drilled into them that um, you must speak English, you must act like this. They had um, exemptions, so these certificates to say, um, okay, you're acting, uh, shall I say, white enough um, so that you can go to the pub and get a drink. You had to have a certificate to go to the pub <laughs> and do certain things. Um, so this demeaning treatment to say, oh, you're a good enough a citizen to be able to enjoy what the other citizens are enjoying. Those policies where they've made people, I guess, um, be able to, well, have, have to get a certificate to be able to do what everybody else is doing, like go to the pub, those demeaning policies um, have made people feel like um, distrustful towards government. And then in Australia, we had this awful white Australia policy that didn't end till the early 70s where um, they were asking people, um, they were... Sorry, they weren't letting people of other races come and live here permanently. Um, well, I mean, when I say other races, I mean people with darker skin. And this policy um, was racist. So we really haven't had 
too much time away from that sort of thinking. Well, it's just been 50 odd years. Um, so I feel like I'm really needing to accelerate our ways of thinking about who we want to um, lift up. Sometimes I feel like it's just, um, perhaps it's not spoken about, but you can still sense it. It's more of a quiet, lingering feeling. Sometimes of judgment or people sort of looking at you a bit different um, than, and not with a, a nice, kind face sometimes. And there's also a feeling that, oh, um, Aboriginal people get more than others and their um, entitlements are more, which is rubbish. It's really, really hard for Aboriginal people in this country. So, um, but getting back to my family, um, my mum's parents, um, I guess, were those um, good try to be um, good, upstanding citizens and try to fit within a system and do what they were told. And, and it's just upsetting because they couldn't um, embrace other ways of living. It was just, you do this and you act like this. And then my mum was told to also act like that. And she has, I guess, rebelled against that. <laughs> so she still and it does everything that you need to do to survive in this society but also she holds on to her Aboriginal beliefs and her um, identity and her um, connection to ancestors and the land and she'll use Aboriginal words and she will use them proudly and that's it's fine and she she's very accepting of all different races of people and she's just the loveliest, sweetest person I know. Mm. Yeah, so we can all, I guess, um, try to keep telling those stories of the pain in the past because it's important. Uh, if I didn't tell my 18-year-old Ty about what happened, I feel like Ty would be missing part of the heritage and, and identity is important. Is there something that you would have liked to pass on and that you haven't, for instance? I guess I would like to have passed on more about the Aboriginal culture, but I have felt so um, much like I've been disconnected from it through the colonisation, of course, and... It's something that I wish I, I could have um, learned myself more about and I try to as much as I can. And But sometimes I feel like I'm reading a lot from books or, you know, I'm trying like all the time to talk to people who know more about it or go on, um, listen to elders talk. <laughs> when, mm -hmm. So when I get the chance, that's, that's amazing. Um, but it's not, I, yeah, that disconnected feeling is something that I'm probably passing down. But, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I thank you for going into this very painful topic. Oh, thanks, Sharon. Is there um, a wish that you have for the nearby future? Yeah, I think that I, I wish that Aboriginal issues would get far more time and energy put into them and um, that our voices get heard and that people understand and that the collective trauma, I guess, gets carried by all of us, not just maybe not just Aboriginal people, but everybody 
all people holding um, onto each other and, and realising that that pain is maybe for all of us, all of humanity to, to feel and then understand and then try to heal from and learn from so that it doesn't happen again. May your words be heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tanya, so, so much. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Invisible Wound. And I do hope that we can contribute to making Aboriginal voices more heard here. In our next episode, we have the great honor to have an elder on. His name is Uncle Boydie. He will share with us his story, but also the one of his grandfather, William Cooper. <laughs>